Before we discuss the experience of Jews in Ashkenaz, I'd like to take a little bit of a broader approach for a moment to speak about the structure of the Jewish community. Uh, what I'm going to describe is something that pertains really to much of the 2,000 years of diaspora history that we've been looking at. There's certainly wide variation between the various communities that we'll be looking at, but by and large, the structure that I'm going to describe for you now held for most of Jewish communities, as far as we can tell, both Ashkenazic and Sephardic, really right from the beginnings of the diaspora right up until uh, the 18th century, as we'll discuss today. And so while there are differences in terminology, to be sure, and sometimes differences in the relative level of authority invested in particular uh, structures within the community. Nevertheless, speaking in broad strokes, this is uh, a major element of the uh, survival of the Jewish people over their 2,000 years in diaspora. Um, and it's, it's rather remarkable that, in my humble opinion, they've managed to figure a way to survive after it was uh, largely destroyed in the last couple of centuries. But let's try to understand it writ large and understand that there will be specific differences when you go to particular towns and particular communities. The name for this community varies, again, again from uh, Sephardic and Ashkenazic lands, but one of the most common terms is the word kehila which means literally congregation, in the sense of to congregate. The, the Hebrew word kahal, which is also used sometimes to describe the kahila, uh, is really a reference to the bringing together of people. And so this is one of the terms that was used, particularly in Ashkenazic lands, to describe the community. Now, I think at its foundation, one of the most important elements of the kahila is the fact that it was based on a system of taxation, that you know everything takes money to run, and the uh, the kahila developed early on a form of taxation of Jews living in a particular municipality, and then was able to generate those funds more or less efficiently into a rather remarkable self-government. Uh, we're going to be talking today primarily about what we would call, let's say, municipal self-government that would be located to a specific town, uh, in some cases a village or a city even. Uh, when you get to the modern period, you begin to see uh, cities supporting more than one kahila. The idea of separating a single kahila associated with a city into several kahilot was something that was fraught with controversy, and we'll speak about that when we get to the 19th century in particular. But right now, we're really speaking about how the Jews would organize themselves within a fairly small geographic area associated with one particular town. Okay, let's look at the org chart of the kahila. We should begin with the institution known as the Tuve Ha'ir, which literally means the good people of the city. By good people, that basically means people who are wealthy. That's probably the most important criterion to be in this key group, which is essentially kind of like a board of directors of the uh, organization, uh, like a board of directors of the synagogue. And by the way, uh, the contemporary structure of synagogues today is uh, based very heavily on the design of the kehilas as well. So the Tuba year would typically uh, wealthy people, almost always they were universally male, uh, they were tended to be property owners and so on. Occasionally there would be like a nomination of someone who was a well-known scholar, but that was clearly the exception to the rule. The Tuve Ayer had this unusual kind of responsibility of, uh, on the one hand, they received the honor of being in this august group and uh, recognition for their leadership efforts and so on, but at the same time, they were also responsible for coming up with shortfalls if the taxation system did not generate enough funds from the uh, impoverished people of the city. So it was a responsibility of leadership that uh, good people took on in order to support the community, and the honor that was bestowed on them was really a, a recognition of uh, the, uh, the time and energy and finances that they would also devote to the upkeep of the city. They would typically take from their group one member who would be the Parnas. And by the way, both of these uh, institutions were democratically elected, the Tuve Ir, typically for a multi-year 
contract, which was not remunerated. This was an unpaid position, uh, but you know there would be these regular elections, and not everyone could necessarily stand for election, but we're talking about small groups of people, right? When you get to the later period, when you might have several thousand people in a community, then it's a little bit more complicated, but you know, in small Kehilot, which were the, the bulk of the medieval period, we're talking about 500, 1,000, 2,000 people at most, so it's not a huge organization. The Parnas, or uh, literally the president, you can see there might be even a relationship between the Hebrew and the English word, was essentially the chief executive officer of the Kehila. Nominated from the Tuveha ear, the Parnas, typically male, would be given the responsibility of exercising oversight of the functioning of the uh, the entire kehila. Uh, the tuveyer would also be responsible for the appointment of the rabbi, and the rabbi would assemble the Beit Din. Now, this is a really significant uh, point. Although there were times when the tuveyer had very little say in who appointed the rabbi, uh, for example, we'll see this when we get to the 18th century in Poland in particular, but generally speaking, the community would be responsible to appoint a rabbi and to pay his salary. Uh, this meant that there was kind of an unusual relationship where the rabbi, who was technically the uh, leader of the community on at least a theological level, because the rabbi, who was always a he, of course, um, had a sense of the the nature of Jewish law and how the community should be directed according to it. But in reality, he was supported by the Tuvia ear, and he had a, a he had a responsibility to uh, adhere to their wishes as well. There were times when the Tuvia ear or the Parnas came into conflict with the rabbi, and this is like in contemporary synagogues when the president of the synagogue wants one thing and the rabbi wants another thing. You know, it can be a real showdown. But nevertheless, the, the rabbi had tremendous symbolic and often real authority based in the uh, dictates of the Talmud. The rabbi would, of course, be responsible for adjudicating disputes, which would involve the assembling of a beit in a court uh, of typically three rabbis who would be involved in the discussion. We should realize that the title rabbi does not necessarily mean that person has control over the entire community. Um, the title rabbi could be used in many different contexts, including teachers in schools, and uh, if there were more than one synagogue in a community, and things like that. At any rate, both the Parnas and the rabbi used a group of people called the Gabayim to enforce their will. Uh, so the term Gabai literally means collector, and we uh, we see that, for example, in Pirkei Avot, where it's used in that sense much more uh, clearly. Uh, uh, today, a, a synagogue Gabai is kind of like a synagogue functionary who just decides which person gets various uh, honors in which sequence on a Saturday morning. But in the Kahila, the Gabai was a feared individual uh, who was essentially the... Uh, not exactly the policeman, but the uh, summons deliverer of the Tuvea ear or of the Beitin. If you had most commonly an individual who refused to pay the assessed taxes, um, and this was based essentially on the decision of the Tuvea ear or of the Parnas exclusively, then uh, the Gabayim would be there to make sure that they collected, you know, the cow or the uh, gold coins or whatever it is that was collected. Uh, or if an individual, for example, refused to uh, appear for a summons before the Beit Din, then the Gabayim would be there to muscle him over there. And we'll talk about this perhaps in a later class, but we should understand that the Gabayim actually had the authority to use corporal punishment uh, with the direction, of course, of the Beit Din. And in some rare occasions, there's even some discussion of capital punishment. Too much for our discussion right now, but we should understand that the Gabayim are truly significant fixtures in the operation of the Kehillah. Now, in terms of the day-to-day -day experience of the Kehillah, um, most of the people involved in the Kehillah, the Jewish members of the Kehillah, would experience this 
solely through the yearly taxation that would be assessed by the Tuvea year, and they would have to pay what they could for it. There's typically a lot of impoverishment in the Kahila, and those taxes are not used for self-aggrandizement uh, for these unpaid Tuvea year and so on. The money then flows into the actual services provided by the Kahila, and this is extremely important. This is certainly the largest chunk of the Kahila operation was conducted in the forms of chevrot or committees. And unlike most of these other boxes that I put on the screen so far, the chevrot had a lot of female participation as well. The chevrot essentially provided the services that are remarkable by comparison to later times and to other uh, aspects of a given you know, location uh, where the Jews, very small population, nevertheless organized themselves very effectively to take care of all of the needs that they could identify in a community. Let's look at some of the typical chevrot that you find. Uh, there is, of course, the king of the chevrot is the chevra kadisha, or the holy chevra. By the way, I would translate chevra here as, let's say, committee, but it really means um, colleagues, friends, Aramaic term. Um, which is Haver in modern Hebrew. So the Hevra Kadisha was the holy association, the holy group of friends. Uh, there will be one group for men and one group for women uh, who dealt with the very important issue of how to uh, provide for a proper burial. The Hevra Kadisha tended to wield an outsized power, not only because of the uh, rather dire consequences of their potential refusal to provide a Jewish burial for an individual, uh, but also because it tended to be comprised of the most well-respected individuals of a given community. Uh, it tended to be uh, populated by people who were older, uh, people who were well-regarded. Uh, we should understand that according to Jewish thought, the traditional Jewish thought, the person who has passed on, the deceased, is aware of the things happening around him or her during the process of preparation for burial. And therefore, if there are people who are like uh, ne'er-do-wells or who are disrespectful of the course, this is considered a grave affront to the, the uh, deceased, and therefore they tended to choose people who would approach the difficult task with the appropriate solemnity and respect for the dead. In fact, one of the last things that they do after they complete the preparations for the dead is the members of the Heber Kadisha apologize in case they had done anything by accident that was untoward or, or perceived as disrespectful by the deceased. At any rate, the Heber Kadisha had a lot of power and was typically the premier of all the various committees. But there are uh, Hebras that are associated with education, uh, very important. The Hebra Shas, which uh, typically was dealing with adult education, was one thing, but they would often organize themselves for children's education, which was typically paid for uh, by tuition on a familiar basis, but there was a tremendous emphasis on trying to uh, give a much higher level of literacy to both boys and girls, at least at the very primary ages. We'll speak about this in more specific detail a little bit later on, God willing. Uh, also, Biker Cholim, uh, which means literally visiting or examining the uh, those who are ill, and this was associated with providing for health care. Uh, Tomche Shabbos was a committee I should say is. These are committees which are still functioning in many Jewish communities today, of course. Uh, essentially a food bank to make sure that people had wherewithal to uh, celebrate Shabbat with the appropriate amount of food. Uh, you had Ozer Dalim, which was uh, uh, those who aid the poor, more associated with uh, housing for the indigent and uh, feeding them and so on. Haknasat Kala, a very important committee that was uh, tasked with providing for young families uh, who did not have necessarily the, the wherewithal to start their life as a married couple. Uh, Linat Tzedek for travelers. Uh, this is essentially hospitality. Uh, Hevra Tehillim, which was one of the most well-known uh, Hebras that would deal with uh, the various pious needs of the community, where Hebra Tehillim would typically bring people together to recite psalms on behalf of those who were ill and so on. And we could literally, you know, go on and on all day talking about the different committees that were set up ad hoc individual in individual communities, but uh, this is just a sampling of some of the many 
associations that would be set up by men and especially by women in order to meet the needs of the community in their regular functioning. It's really rather impressive, I think, when you look at the, uh, the overall structure of the community that was mirrored over and over again in so many different municipalities. And when we look a little bit further down the road at the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, we see actually a, a high point in Jewish self-government when all of the uh, individual communities join together in literally a state within the state so that they could actually have kind of like a government to pass legislation that affected all Kahilot uh, simultaneously. We'll have to talk about how that worked out later on, but nevertheless, it's a really impressive achievement, I think, in, in Jewish self-government. And it says a lot about what allowed the Jews to survive to the modern era. Now, speaking about the modern era, we should understand like, wow, this is so great. Why isn't it happening anymore? Well, we have to understand that the pre-modern Jewish communal structure is very much predicated on a level of coercion. That is, the Tuvea ear have the right to assess your taxes. And this is above and beyond what the community as a whole has to pay to the non-Jewish state authorities. By the way, this was typically organized in a, in a corporate fashion, meaning that you know, in very rare cases, did you have individual people actually having to pay individual taxes to the non-Jewish state? Uh, taxes were typically assessed on the Jews as a whole, and the Jewish community had to, like, translate that into taxes upon individuals. So there's kind of a natural flow from that to taxes to support the Jewish community as well. But there's that, that one coercive element that comes in the form of taxes, uh, and the other major coercive element is that what we might call religious or non-religious freedom. If you stepped out of line from community norms, you faced the wrath of the Beit Din, uh, of the rabbi of the city, of the Tuvayair who might feel that your behavior was uh, not going to represent the community well to the non-Jews in the neighborhood and so on. These are really important things that, that helped corral Jews within kind of like a set of boundaries for behavior. These would be challenged uh, throughout the entire period that we're looking at, but most especially when we get to the modern era. And in this regard, the uh, attacks on the Jewish communal structure are one of the most important elements of what makes modernity for Jews. Uh, we're not there yet in terms of our Jewish History Lab series. It's going to be a few months till we really talk about it. But just to glance ahead to understand where we are now, by contrast, uh, this all fell apart uh, in the 18th century, partially because of uh, you know, Jewish erosion of the system, that you can see the roots of it, especially from the 15th and 16th century onward. But it really collapses in the wake of the French Revolution, in which French authorities said, wait a second, we can't tolerate a dual system of government within our new republic. I mean, like, it sounds like these gabais, they sound like police forces. How do you have a French police force and then a separate Jewish French police force? And what you're doing, collecting money from people, even against their will, that sounds a lot like what the state should be doing, not individual organizations. You want to have voluntary contributions, that's fine, but you want to actually assess taxes? No way. So uh, the French Revolution essentially gave everything to Jews, gave rights to Jews as individuals, but nothing to Jews as communities. And that meant that the Kila structure, which had the benefit of really keeping Jews from assimilating outright for much of the medieval period, this came crashing to a halt. Now, Napoleon restored some elements of that. Here you see a, a rather remarkable uh, image of Napoleon in, from 1806, uh, restoring the dignity of the fallen Jewish woman, holding on to the Ten Commandments there. Uh, in uh, Napoleon's right hand, he's holding up the law, right? And you can see kind of like the the messianic overtones of his self-image with uh, Judea in the background and the menorah, the temple ground, things like that. So there's this, this idea of somehow restoring Jewish dignity uh, despite modernity. Um, here's another even more amazing image. This is something which 
Jews who were in favor of emancipation of Napoleon gave to him. Uh, on the left, of course, is Napoleon, uh, emperor and king, it says, and on the right, celebrating the reestablishment of the Sanhedrin, uh, the Jewish court, which is not at all like the Sanhedrin of ancient years. Again, we'll talk about this in, in a few months. Uh, but here is Napoleon on the left, who is literally handing the Ten Commandments to a, a Osequius and defeated Moses, who's got his left hand kind of like over his heart saying, oh, thank you, great emperor, and reaching out with great deference to Napoleon. I mean, wow, it's like even hard to look at this thing. But nevertheless, that's the, uh, that's the conception of, uh, for some, of what happened with emancipation, that Napoleon actually, you know, allowed the Jews to celebrate their religion, when in reality, getting rid of the kahila structure meant that the, he removed the coercive elements of the kahila, which also meant that there was going to be a huge lack of authority of the rabbis, of the Jewish elders, and so on. Um, so much more to say about this, but it's really modern, and we're focused on pre-modern for the next uh, few weeks at least. Now, let us not think that this was, you know, set in stone and inviolable and that no Jews had any say in it. Uh, complaining about the Kahila was a very common thing we see in all kinds of archival sources. And there were avenues of appeal. I mean, if you didn't like what the uh, Tuvair taxed you, you could go to the Beit Din and lodge a protest, and there would be some adjudication of it. Yes, it's true that the rabbi is essentially paid by those taxes that you are now protesting, but on the other hand, the rabbi has the great you know, authority of the Torah behind him, and so those values of money versus Torah have to somehow sort themselves out. And there were also ways in which even people who did not have the wherewithal to easily initiate these kinds of legal challenges could nevertheless make their voices heard, especially women. Uh, there were various disruptive behaviors that people could engage in, women in particular. One of my favorites is uh, disrupting the Sabbath services, where if a woman felt that she was maltreated by the system, uh, she could, it was definitely highly discouraged, but she could simply walk into the men's section on a Saturday morning and stand right there in front of the Aaron, in front of the Holy Ark, and refuse to allow the uh, Torah to be read until her uh, case was heard or until at least a promise was made that her case would be heard. This was like, you know, uh, not unheard of, but definitely a very radical way to challenge the system. Uh, the voices of women could be heard, albeit in extremis, uh, but nevertheless you do have examples of this uh, disruptive behavior that allow the voices of less powerful people to be heard, even despite the very strong authority of the Tuvayir and the Beitin. Okay, that's it for a very quick look at the structure of the Jewish community before the modern era and some sense of its power base. Let's go on now to talk about the First Crusade and its impact on the Jewish communities in the Rhineland. Thank you very much for watching.